Welcome back to the Forge for another vlog. Uh, thank you for joining us. So, uh, before we get going, I just want to say a massive shout out and a big thank you to all you guys that are supporting us on Patreon. Um, your help and support is obviously helping me make more videos and put a bit more time aside to, to make more content for you. So, um, big thank you for all of you who are helping me. Um, it, it really is appreciated. Now, um, I've fallen a little bit behind last week. It got a bit busy around the workshop, got called out to measure a couple of jobs and go and collect things for the farm and do a few other bits and pieces. So I didn't quite finish my dragon, but I'm getting there. I'm getting there. We got the head on. So uh, I managed to make the skeleton for the head and we've, I've skinned it in a probably half, uh, half mil, one mil sheet steel, which makes it much easier when I'm using these really small dragon scales. Now, these things are absolutely tiny. They're not much bigger than the end of your finger. And uh, they're just a little bit on the fiddly side to be dealing with. And my big MIG welder, my uh, 470 amp, whatever it is, 500 amp MIG welder, does not like welding little stuff like this. It, um, it's got an auto wire feed, which just makes it a right pain in the backside. Got my horns forged as well. Got all my spikes done. Got some teeth. Remember to do it in the right order this time. I actually put the uh, inside of the jaw on there before I finish the head. So uh, that made it much, much easier. Got a little tongue in there as well. It's not breathing fire, this sculpture. Though. That's not the aim of the game on this one. But it's coming together. It's starting to look really nice. And uh, hopefully the customer will be, uh, will be pleased. Unfortunately, I'm uh, probably best part of half a week behind now. So it um, doesn't look like I'm going to get this one done by the end of the month. Uh, even though I'll get, probably get the sculpture done in the next two days. I then got to send it off to be galvanized. That takes um, anywhere from sort of three days up to a week maybe 10 days, depending on their workload and everything else. And then obviously it's got to come back. I got to clean it. And then we got to book in, go to fit it. And because of the rock it's on weighs roughly a ton, uh, we're going to need some lifting equipment down the other end because the clients don't have a forklift, which isn't too surprising because um, they've got a posh house. You know, most people with houses don't have a forklift. I haven't got a forklift at my house. Um, I've got one in the workshop. Uh, what else have we been up to? So uh, we also been trying to rustle up some plant supports. So uh, we spent uh, about a day last week, I guess, sorting out this jig. I've uh, got 13 of those to make, I think, for one client. And a client's chasing me, jumping up and down, going, where's my blooming plant supports? It's officially spring, I need to plant my plants. So um, we had to sort of drop where we were on last week, rustle up a jig. So this jig is, um, I thought a head see, and um, I cut this out on the new machine and cut all the holes with a new machine as well. They're, they're not perfect, they need the holes that it cuts, but uh, a little bit of a skim with the drill is an awful lot quicker than doing all the layout on there and uh, doing that. So anyway, I've got to wind some eight mil round all the way to the top of that uh, and give it some something for the plants to support. So two of those together should form, should form an arch, um, which you can walk underneath. Uh, it's about eight foot high-ish when it's in the ground. There's about half a meter going in the ground as well. So there's that happening. Uh, the other thing I managed to have a bit of a play with uh, last week was a um, new belt grinder. So I've got a few of these, spin round. I've got a few belt grinders now, and these are all homemade. Um, I've built, built all of these over the years, so I think that was the first one I built. Uh, that was probably the second one. All the wheels being stolen off because they're on another machine. Uh, and then there's this one. The nice thing about them, they're all interchangeable. So I've made them in all the same stock sizes. Um, they're all quick change, so all you gotta do push down on the top, releases the belt, off the belts come, and um, you know, you can swap them out, swap all the ends, which is important. So like, I've got a one inch wheel on this one. Uh, we've got an 80 mil wheel. I think that's uh, about six inch. And there's a 14 inch wheel somewhere down there on the floor, uh, which doesn't get used very often. I don't need a big rad that often, but I had a bit of a play on the computer and rustled up this design. So I've sort of refined it a little bit. And then I sent it off to have it laser cut. So. Uh, it's my new Phoenix 2x72, and I'm going to powder coat this once I'm happy that everything's fully operational and working. Um, fully adjustable tilting head with an adjustable platen on it as well. It's not bolted to the floor, which is why wobbly. Uh, laser cut a little table out so I can like clamp jigs down, um, put little guide blocks and stuff like that for, uh, you know, if you're doing a big sword or something. But I'm probably going to have this recut and do it maybe two or three times larger uh, just to make things a bit easier. Uh, bought some quick thumb catches and releases, if I can actually do this with my bad wrist, which I can't. Um, so yeah, that's coming. All I've got to do is sort out the wiring, give it a test run, make sure it's all working, everything's running parallel and true. Um, and there's a few niggles on my design 
like uh, when I drew this on the computer, I didn't have the pivot in quite the right place. So I've had to modify it a little bit. So I've been updating the drawing and stuff for that as well. And I'm probably going to make the um, the D bar itself uh, maybe 30% bigger. Um, and the other thing I did, a little cool feature, is that I put a, a point on one piece and a notch on the other. So you can always set it back to 90 degrees without having to get out squares and all the other bits and pieces. So that was quite cool. So um, I'm hoping to obviously get that sorted out, get that finished up and rustled up and, you know, maybe even sell them. That, that's a possibility uh, if I can get the price price down to a, you know, point where we we can sell it and, you know, people are happy paying for it because I don't want to charge the earth. I want things to be accessible for everybody, most people. Um, the other thing that I managed to finally get done this week was we managed to fix the power armor. So I have now got two working power armors, not three because the other one's still dead. But it's all back in the machine. Had to, um, yeah, the, the reason this power armor had died is because the nuts had fallen off these little bolts that hold the motor in place through the vibration of obviously the power armor hammering itself. And uh, I hadn't noticed. And then it ripped the, um, the foot plate off the, uh, well, the foot plate had fallen in half because it's only an aluminium casting. It's not particularly strong. Um, and uh, there's an awful lot of torque and everything else on the power armor. So anyway, she's back up and running, which is bloody brilliant. And I did say to Andy uh, a couple of weeks ago that I would have a quick chat about power armor tooling. Now, um, this is my Tannard, uh, I think it's a 40, it might be a 50. It's certainly got a bit more punch than the C41. So I'm thinking it might be a 50 kilo um, hammer, this one. It doesn't have any plates on the side of it, so you can't really, can't really tell. Um, most of the time, I'm forging tapers uh, with my power armors. I'm using them for, um, you know, drawing out bar to length and changing stock sizes. Um, and the tool I use most often is this one, which is my flatter. And I tend to do flatting in a bit of a different way. I didn't come up with this design, but um, it's a design that's been around for a long, long time. And you've basically got a floating, floating sorry, um, almost, you know, bottom die. And the holes are oversized to, to allow it to move should it need to. Oh, she's coming down. Stay there. Top's a good fit on this one, so uh, sometimes it'll stay up in the air. Um, but the nice thing about this block is it conforms to your piece of steel. Now, have I got something with a taper forged on the end? Yes, I do. There's the bar. So, it doesn't matter what you put in there. Oh, she's coming down. She's going to bite me. I'm not putting my fingers under there. Um, the, the taper block will, will adjust to suit. So, you know, if you're forging parallel stock, you know, you can do that. She's, she's trying to bite me this hammer. Go on then, bite it. No. Whoa. There we go. <laughs> I'll have to turn it on to rescue that. Um, but yeah, th that's the tool I use most often. It's absolutely brilliant. I don't have to worry about the block jumping out because it's held in place on the side lugs. Um, and it, it's free to float around and move around. It's ever so slightly bigger than the top die so that I don't end up with any sharp edges. Um, it doesn't bite in. And I made that on the lathe. I turned down a a big piece of, uh, I think it was 80 square. I, I bored a hole up the center then sort of sliced it in half. Um, and then I had a chunk of, I think that's 60 or 70 mil round. It might be a three inch round. I'll just turn the hammer on so I can rescue that thing out of it. Now, first out, I'll grab that. Okay, so the other bit of power hammer tool in that I use all of the time is my little saddle block. Uh, and I've only started using one of these in the last sort of 12 months. Um, and it's basically, uh, lots of my tooling have these little, uh, have these little like sleeves basically that sit over the top of the power hammer die. Um, and the problem is that they're a bit of a bugger sometimes to change. You know, they're quite fiddly, quite awkward. Um, and I saw this online, and also a lot of the tooling you've got to hold in with your hands, and you kind of want two hands free quite often. Um, whereas this little saddle block is brilliant because, don't bite me. Ah, right, there we go. I can literally just drop, drop the tooling in. That's a little depth stop, which just sits in there. You know, it's held in, it's not going anywhere. Um, 
and it's bloody brilliant. And not only I, well, I started using it just for these, for the depth stops, because, you know, before that, I was using bits and pieces like this, um, which, you know, you end up clamping on the top, getting focus you, um, you know, and you put a G clamp on your, on your uh, power hammer die and trying to hold it in, but ev eventually the vibrations make the thing fall on the floor, and that was a pain in the backside. Um, and I made this one a while ago. This is my um, acorn uh, swage, and it forges these little acorns. You see that? Get on a plain background. Come on, focus. There we are. Um, and it forges these little acorns. You, you get your bit of 12mm round, shove it in there, give it a smash with a power hammer, and um, out pops your little acorn. And then you can extend the taper on a taper block. So um, that little saddle block is absolutely brilliant. And uh, I'm going to end up making these for all the power hammers. Although I might part with one of the power hammers. Um, and we've got all sorts of other tooling. So this is a, a die for making round bar or more for tenons really. Um, and they're all sized. I think that's like 6mm, 8mm, 10 12 um, And it's all spring loaded. And there's also... Um, little round bar that are welded in come on focus camera i'm a bit too close uh round bar there that help it stay in line uh but the round bar don't come out the top so that the power hammer itself doesn't end up driving into them and again this one's on a little saddle block that drops over the top now absolutely brilliant um don't use it a huge amount not that little tool anyway uh, i don't tend to do my tenons that way because i've got the lathe i prefer the accuracy of the lathe so um, if I'm making tenons up, I'll tend to do it on there because I know usually if I'm doing like tenons on round bar, for instance, um, you know, the front style and the back style, or if I'm doing them vertical, the bottom and top rail, they're a fixed height. Um, so I'm much better off doing that on the lathe. And usually, you know, you're turning a 12 mil bar or something down to about eight mil round. It takes, you know, two minutes on the lathe as opposed to forging it, which is really time consuming. Now, um, the bigger power hammer has a lot more tooling. Uh, this is still broken. I haven't gotten around to fixing the electrics for this yet. Um, I was up at the motor place last week when I picked up the power hammer dies. Power hammer dies? No, the electric motor foot for the for the other power hammer to do that. Anyway, got talking to him about fixing Frankenstein. And uh, the guy up there, they, they're motor rewind specialists. He did seem to think that he'd be able to make me a new one of these. Um, or certainly something from this century that would turn... Uh, this motor on or off. Unfortunately, the big power amp motor is a slip ring motor and they don't really make those anymore. Well, they do, but they're on things like wind turbines, which are, you know, millions of pounds. Um, and so then they're not very common. The advantage of the slip ring motor is it's better for starting big beastie hammers like this because um, it controls the amount of torque and the speed that things run at. But unfortunately, it's not bloody working, so I can't use it, which is frustrating. But anyway, back to power amp tooling. So what do we got on this? Um, at the moment, I've got combi dies on the power hammer. I've got combi dies on all of my power hammers. And basically, what a combi die is, is you've got your uh, your square block with a, a rad on half of it. And then on the other end, you've got some form of radius. So this one's actually quite tight. Uh, and if I grab a bit of steel, there's one. Oh, come here, dude. So there's a bit of steel that's just been bashed under those combi dies. And you can see it's actually a really big and broad full of that. Well, it's actually quite tight rad. Um, this was done in one heat, just as a bit of a play once I got the power hammer back. Uh, smash that out. Great fun. The bigger the hammer, the more fun it is, the more fun you can have. Um, the other thing that I've got with this power hammer are pallets. Um, unfortunately, one of these got lost in transit. So I've got the bottom die, uh, the bottom pallet for the power hammer. Uh, and I've ordered some steel. It's actually sat on the miller machine. It's been sat on the miller machine for six months. Uh, for making the, a top die to go with this one. Um, and we've got all sorts of other bits of kit. Oh, there's a bottom saddle. Is that a bottom saddle? No, I'm not sure what that is. Random bits for stuff for this power hammer. Uh, things like uh, bottom swages. There's tapered blocks. It's all a bit of mess around here. When you have a tidy up round the forge. Uh, so there's a, a tapered block for that power hammer. That's seen some use. And uh, again, it, you know, the way it's designed is it just sits on that, uh, on one of the dies and it just clamps on with a G-clamp. Um, I'm not a big fan of that because things under big power hammers tend to move around quite a bit. Um, what have we got here? Oh, we've got a spring swage for doing a double fuller. 
So that's really helpful, um, you know, if you're doing really sharp tapers or you're trying to uh, separate stock. So if you're doing something like a penny end on the end of a hinge, uh, you can, you know, do that double set down quite nicely. Uh, what's that? That's a, that's a tool holder. That came with a power hammer. I've never used that. Um, what else is here? Now, this is a tool. So the nice thing about the bigger power hammers, you know, it's a 200 weight, this machine. So it's got 100 kilo top weight. Plus the force. I don't know if I can get it in the light. There we are. So this is a ta uh, this is a parallel swage, but I use this for texturing feathers. I did a big bench for a client uh, a few years ago, and that was all out of stainless steel. And there was about 500 feathers on on the thing, and they were all made out of of flat bar. And um, yeah, basically drop forged them, which was quite nice. Uh, that's another ball. I think that's a ball swage. Yeah, that's a ball swage. Uh, in there. I need a, I need another rack. That's not power arm at all. Uh, things like this. This is just a texturing tool. Come on, camera, focus. Texturing tool made out of an old file, which gives quite a nice uh, effect on a piece of bar. Don't doesn't get used very much. I'm not the biggest fan of texture on stuff. Um, all sorts of things. So you know, just a chunk of round bar welded to a handle. And use that for um, you know doing things like heel bars where you want a, a nice fuller on there. Um, punches. Got that punches uh, missing a chunk. <laughs> uh, what have we got? Ah, oh, there we go. There's another feather uh, die. In the end, I moved away from trying to texture both sides, and we just ended up making these blocks to fit the different size stock that we were using, and um, basically just drop forged the flat bar and ran it through, and. Um, yeah, produced meter upon meter upon meter of textured bar. But um, yeah, it's bloody handy, the big hammer. Uh, it's, a, it's a shame that it's not fully working at the moment. What else have we got down here? Oh, there's another ball swage. So uh, this one is for larger stock. It's probably for 20 mil round to make nice balls. I'll be using that one shortly. Keep that one out. Um, I've got a gate to make for a client, which is... Um, the gate I'm going to be doing has got lots of vine leaves on it, so that's going to be quite cool. I've uh, got bunches of grapes to make, basically, so I'll be using that tool, um, and I might make some smaller ones then as well to make up those bunches of grapes. So there's all sorts of bits. There's loads of other power armor tool in it. It's all spread around at the moment. I haven't had a good tidy up in the forge for a while. Um, joys of classes not being run in. It's, it's allowed me to get a bit more disorganized. Uh, so, uh, yeah, it's all got a bit, bit mad. But uh, we'll have a good tidy up and uh, sort out a new rack for it once I stop moving bits and pieces around. But um, yeah, I haven't made much tooling for the C41. Obviously it's been a new hammer. I've uh, probably only given it 12, 15 hours work since it's arrived in the workshop. Uh, and I just haven't got around to doing any tooling for that one yet. And I may part with it. See, I bought the two hammers with the intention that I wouldn't have to change tools. You know, I'd have the, whatever tool it was, a fuller and die or something on this little hammer. And then I could change over and um, you know, use my flatter, for instance, on the on the hammer next to it, and that was the intention. But I don't do that sort of stuff that often, and there's quite a lot of money tied up in that machine. So yeah, and I kind of fancy a new hydraulic press because as lovely as this hydraulic press is, it's not very big. It's only got 22 tons of push, uh, and I miss my 50 ton press that I used to have. And there is a, an 80 ton press for sale at the moment. But I need some cash. So we'll see what happens on that front. We may not afford it. I can't afford it at the moment. Um, so anyway, <clears throat> uh, so that pretty much sums up what we've been up to over the last sort of week or so and uh, how we're getting on and what we've been doing with machines and bits and pieces. Um, I know one of you guys asked me about fly press tooling, but I think I'll go over that uh, next week perhaps and show you some of the different bits and kit we've got for the fly press um, because that's probably the most useful bit of equipment you can lay your hands on. If you're starting out blacksmithing, get yourself a fly press. Before you buy, go out buying power hammers or anything else, or hydraulic presses, the fly press is the most useful tool you can get for 200 quid. Trust me. So, aside from that, um, we'll see you on Wednesday for another essential skills lesson. Uh, Friday for a new bottle opener. And I'm hoping to put up uh, the pirate dagger that I made. Hoping to do the editing, finish the editing for that. So that'll be going live on Saturday, I hope. Um, other than that, remember you can follow us on Instagram and Facebook. Uh, support us, of course, on Patreon if you fancy helping me make more videos for you guys. And we'll see you here next time in the workshop. Cheers, guys.